Welcome to another live episode of the Eric Crocker Show, live and direct, 8 a.m. Pacific. Of course, I'm your host, former NFL and AFL defensive back, Eric Crocker, and it's Wednesday. So, of course, on Wednesdays, we are joined by the lovely Coach Desi. Coach Desi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm ready to talk Brock Purdy, Aaron Banks' injury, uh, Micah Parsons. He didn't take it personal when they got their ass kicked two years in a row. And then it took a T-shirt to get him uh, riled up, I guess. So we'll discuss that. And then Debo Samuel and his comments. And we might touch on the Cleveland Browns as well. But uh, before we get into all of that, I, I definitely – you said there's an intro or something? I have a, pr- a surprise. So I am so stoked that we beat the Cowboys so badly – which I was literally like, if we win, I'm going to do an intro. So if y'all, I know you guys have all watched Get Up, Brini's intro where he rhymes. So I wrote one just for Croc. So this is just for you. You ready to go? I'm ready. Here it is. Good morning. Welcome to the Eric Crocker Show where we talk to Croc about Brock and how Dallas got socked and Dak got knocked. Are the 49ers the bullies on the block? Check the clock. It's time to rock with the man, the legend. Let's go, Croc. Woo! I like that. That was good. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm going to steal that audio. And uh, I'm actually going to, I can steal that and I can put it over some like music and I'm going to use that. So uh, <laughs> let's go. I'm going to, I'm going to take that audio and, and rip it and, and put add it to my uh, soundboard. Yeah. Shout out to everybody that's here. You know, good morning. Guess, good morning, Mr. Olight. We got the 13 in here. We got Gabriel Reyes. We got 49ers throwbacks. A lot of good people in here. Eric Garcia, Eric with a K. All right, Gabriel in here. Mr. Olight, good morning, everybody, man. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing good. I I got up. Uh, My wife was already gone. She went. She got a workout in. I'm like, okay, let me go hit the treadmill. So I like to kind of get my cardio in in the morning, just 30 minutes on the treadmill, incline, and then I'll go get my lift in um, probably about an hour or so after we uh, do this. But here we go. We got Daniel in the chat. Johnny Dale's football. Okay, so here's the thing. All right, so Johnny Dale, shout out to Johnny Dale. If you guys aren't following his YouTube account, I believe he just hit 20,000 subscribers. So uh, make sure y'all tune in. It's a 49ers dedicated uh, account, and he breaks down a lot of film, and it's some of the best stuff that you'll see uh, as far as insight with the 49ers. And uh, Johnny talked about Greg. And Greg went on Johnny, my guy, Greg Pinelli, he went on Johnny's uh, YouTube channel one time. And everybody, well, I don't want to say everybody. Greg, you know, I kind of introduced Greg to like the YouTube side of things. And he's awesome. He's amazing. When it comes to uh, the, like, the quarterback mechanics and all that, like just, just understanding it. I mean, he understands it to like the highest level and and functioning. and, And Greg is a... Uh, no BS guy, straight shooter. And I feel like if people got a chance to talk to him like off of camera, it's like he's a he's a cool, great dude. He tries to keep it cool for Instagram but uh, or for YouTube and on Twitter. But really, if he said what was on his mind all the time, I think he might ruffle a lot of feathers. But uh, Greg is waiting for me to create a channel so that he and I can do weekly like uh, film breakdowns and have on great guests. And I think it's something that would be awesome. Unfortunately, I just, there's a lot that goes into creating it. So I'm like, dude, you create it. And then it's like, he wants me to create it. And then it's like, it just doesn't get created. So he's a free agent right now. We got to get him wrapped up in, in, um, on this show. But yeah, Johnny Dale's football. I I said that because Johnny put that out the other day talking about uh, Greg. That was awesome stuff. (sighs) All right. We, We have to start with Brock Purdy. And I feel like every week we come on here, we are kind of mentioning another milestone that he's kind of breaking down. And right now, again, he just has not lost a regular season game. Undefeated last year in the regular season, undefeated so far this year in the regular season. I don't know when he's going to lose. You're starting to hear more chatter. And I would say, I I still hear a lot of people say, oh, uh, well, why do people push back on Brock Purdy? Why? I don't know who's pushing back on Brock Purdy because I don't hear it or see it. I see on TV outside of, I think it was Dan Orlovsky who was like, oh, you know, if Mac Jones could play in this offense, like he'd do just as good as Brock Purdy. And it's like, listen, Brock Purdy is operating this offense at the highest level. 
you know, and, and he's operating his offense and comparable to other teams and their offenses to just as high as anyone else, right? And probably the highest in the league. So to say that somebody's going to come in and either be better or just as good, like I can't say that. And I talked about it on Locked On, and this is not to get like crazy about the whole, you know, Brock Purdy and how well he's playing right now. You know, we'll see. But you couldn't tell me that there's another quarterback that could come in and run their offense or run the 49ers offense better than Brock. There might be someone that potentially could run it just as well, maybe Mahomes or whatever. But, like, just to be able to say, you know, without knowing, like, predict that somebody comes in and they run this offense better than what we've seen, I don't even know how you can. Because he's making every throw. He's, uh, you know, completing his passes at a very high clip. He's throwing the ball down the field. He's still killing it in that 10 to 20-yard range. Like, he's not missing – Throws. I mean, he when he has to make a play on the move, he does. So I don't even know, and I'd be excited to know what it would look like if you run this offense at an even higher ability. I don't even know what that looks like because he's doing it so well right now. And maybe everything is just perfect, and maybe he's just, uh, you know, in, in the groove, and maybe this isn't him. I don't know. But I definitely am not pushing back on what we've seen, and he continues to check off every box for me, and it's like, well, you guys really have to start talking about him as an MVP, but maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself. What are your thoughts on what you've seen from Brock Purdy? No, I mean, I have rocked with this guy since day one. I, I have seen something special in him. He's doing, just like you said, he's checking all the boxes. But we talked about last week about how the MVP award is nominated by the Associated Press. With Richard Sherman, you know, just bringing that parade around, I feel like this week with such a big game, Sunday Night Football, he's now starting to get that recognition. I feel like, you know, Rex Ryan has come to his defense. I don't know what this comment about Dan Orlowski, I know he was trying to kind of defend Mac, but it probably would have been better to say something like Mac would do better in a system like what San Francisco has without having to throw Bur uh, Purdy under the bus. Like, I think there's just a better way to state that, but, um, and he has been supportive of, of Brock Purdy and all that he does, but this guy is just special. He's special. And I'm glad he's on our team and I'm glad he's with the, the offense that, that we have, because I do think the system is a perfect marriage for a quarterback like Brock Purdy. Yeah. And I, and I do think, like you said, the, the system, it is a perfect marriage. If you look at his scouting report with him coming out of college, essentially what they were saying Brock Purdy needed was an offense like the 49ers. It, it said really kind of to a T, an offense that is predicated on timing and rhythm, an offense that's not going to require him to make these big arm throws, uh, an offense that's not going to require him have to be the most mobile guy in the pocket. And even though we know he has that mobility and, and especially that short area of quickness, but it doesn't ask for that just every once in a while, right? Can you roll out to the right and hit George Kittle for a touchdown? Just kind of step up in the pocket, roll out and, and buy you some time there. And, and as you see, Coach Desi has her George Kittle jersey on. But the offense, Kyle Shanahan, it's, I think everything, the weapons, everything is tailor-made to where you're going to see the best version of Brock Purdy that you can get. And I say that a lot with cornerbacks, with receivers, right? Uh, why didn't Chad Johnson work out in uh, New England? It was because it wasn't – I got to sneeze. <laughs> All right, why didn't Chad Johnson – excuse me, thank you. Uh, why didn't Chad Johnson work out in New England? Well, it was a different offense, a different fit than what he was used to playing in, and it didn't really highlight what his skill set is, which is kind of maybe at times freelancing a little bit with his routes. It's like you, you can't do that in New England. Well, Brock Purdy, if you say, all right, we want to put Brock Purdy in the Dallas Cowboys offense, which I think is stinky and uncreative, all right, but if you want to put Brock Purdy in that offense, maybe he doesn't do as well. But whatever he's doing with the 49ers, whether it's, you know, the weapons around him, his ability to understand what Kyle Shanahan is asking of him, uh, his ability to execute exactly what he's seeing. I saw a lot of people talking about Trey Lance and uh, giving uh, the, the Cowboys intel, right? And everybody kept saying, well, he can't even read the defense. He can't read the defense. I'm like, that, that's not Trey Lance's issue. Like, he's a smart kid. He's a bright kid. He can retain the information. Like, that's not his problem. His problem is being able to execute it, right? And those are two different things. Like, you can, you know, I can I can tell you 
well, you know, oh, this coverage, and you know, you read the coverage like this and this, and this is what they like to do. I could tell you that, but I can't go out there and execute it at a high level. That's why they last long in the NFL, right? So, um, uh, you know, when you look at Brock Purdy and what he's able to do, he's able to not only understand it at a very high level, but he also can execute it. And I think, uh, the, the more this goes on, I think the more he'll get credit for being that person. Yeah. And he doesn't get rattled. I mean, he really doesn't get rattled. I mean, defenders are right in his face. He knows he's going to get hit. He still like takes a breath and throws and it's not no panic. I mean, I love that. I love that at the, uh, one of the most important positions on the field. That, did I take a shot at Brock Birdie? I don't think so. We were oh, just saying it's a perfect funny. marriage between the player and the system. It is a team right. sport. I mean, it's not like Brock's going out there creating these plays and building the roster and doing all the things. He's just playing his part, like you were saying, to the highest level. And that's what all, all of the – actually, our entire team is doing that right now. And that's what makes it so fun to be a 49er fan right now. I have uh, had some people ask me a question. I got, I got stumped on it, but they asked, how do the 49ers lose? And it was a tough question for me to answer because if you go back to 2019, uh, you know, you can look at that team and the offense didn't start off very well, right? Like kind of the defense was carrying them. And it was very clear that if you would ask me that question in 2019, I'd say, well, if the offense turns the ball over multiple times and the running game isn't clicking, I could see the 49ers getting in trouble and they could potentially lose that way. Well, in this game recently, you know, uh, Christian McCaffrey, who we were talking about, potential MVP candidate, you know, he could continue to score touchdowns and be great. But, you know, he averaged like 2.6 yards a carry or whatever it was. It, it wasn't the best game on the ground from Christian McCaffrey. And the offense still kept clicking because you got Brett Purdy back there at quarterback. So um, right now, if you ask me how the 49ers lose the game, I don't know. I, you know, they just have to completely shoot themselves in the foot and they have to completely uh, do some – things that are out of character that you might only see for a game, right? Like you watch this game and be like, man, that was weird. Like 49ers, they just didn't play their game. And that was how they lost. But if they're just playing their game, you know, there are a lot of teams in the league that can play their game and still lose. And it's like, man, we did these things, but we just don't have enough here. Or we don't have enough there. Or we're just, we're just not good enough defensively. Or we're, we're a couple players away. And kind of reminds me of 2017 where the 49ers had lost five straight games by three points or less. Right. And they, and they were 0 9. And I remember, and I'm just like, they're just a player or two away. Like, they, those guys just aren't on the roster. Then they got Jimmy G, and that kind of changed things. And they were able to win some of those games. But this team right now, I mean, it, it would have to be a drastic out of character game for them to lose. At least that's how it feels. I feel like we also have not been tested by some of those teams that are so great in the AFC. We haven't seen those explosive quarterbacks yet. Uh, we haven't gone against Patrick Mahomes this year. We haven't gone against a Josh Allen. We haven't gone against a very healthy and, and locked in to a Tunga Viola. So I feel like that's something that is yet to be tested. I'm looking forward to those opportunities. Um, but I feel like that's the one thing that I'm just kind of like maybe a little bit holding my breath on. All right, we're going to turn the page here uh, and stop talking about MV Purdy for a second, and we're going to talk about Aaron Banks and his injury. All right, Aaron Banks, he had a bicep injury. Coach Desi, she's going to break down all of that. Uh, but first, I do want to kind of acknowledge something that's been flying under the radar because you have had so many 49er offensive players playing so well. We, we talk about Brock Purdy and how well he's playing. We talk about Christian McCaffrey. Then you look at George Kittle. He had a three-touchdown night. You know, Debo Samuel and – and uh, Brandon Ayuk, you know, they can get off at any time, right? Like, you have all these guys that are playing at such a high level. Then on the offensive line, you just think, oh, Trent Williams, he's kind of carrying the load. But Aaron Banks has been playing at a really high level. Aaron Banks has been very consistent. This is a guy that his rookie year, you know, it was like he didn't even see the field. Matter of fact, the only second-round pick from that year to play less snaps than Aaron Banks was uh, Kyle Trask, the quarterback – from Florida, he was drafted to Tampa Bay. He was the third string quarterback, and then obviously you have Tom Brady there with Tampa, and then their backup was Blaine Gabbard. So, uh, you know, Trash didn't see the field. He was the only second round pick to play less snaps. And I remember when I watched Aaron Banks and what the 49ers were telling us, and I'm like, "What y'all are telling me about this guy isn't matching what I'm seeing on film. He doesn't look like a guy that can move well in space. Uh, he 
he struggles with any type of movement, even right on him right here. Like, this guy is going to be a work in progress. And that's not to say that one day he can't be good. But what they were telling us he was, this guy that can move out in space and do these things. I thought in pass protection, he did a good job of kind of walling guys off because he was a big guy in college. But I didn't see the necessary fit as they were saying it. And obviously, Kyle, you know, he ends up having these conversations with these guys. You got to change some stuff up. All right? You got to change your body. You gotta you gotta figure out you know how you can you know work to get on the field, et cetera. You gotta do these things. And if you do those things, then you know you'll be fine. And since then, he clearly went, re changed his body that year or two. He played very well, started every game, wasn't an issue. And then this year, I think he's even taken it to another level. But now he has this injury to his bicep. So, Coach Desi, I'm gonna pull up some some uh, uh pictures. And then you'll talk to us a little bit about what we are seeing. So uh, let me share the screen here. Present, share screen, and boom. All right. Which picture do I go to first? Uh, the one all the way on the left. Here we go. So this is the scapula bone. It's actually the one that's on the back that lays kind of flat on the rib cage. So this big, giant, kind of lighter area of the bone that you're seeing lays, lays against the uh, rib cage on the back. And then these little nodules that are up at the top, the acromium is the arm that comes around the back. So if you could, <clears throat> can you put your uh, cursor on that all the way up at the top, all the way to the left? I don't know if you can create that. So somebody in the chat said it's not a bicep. So what, what exactly is it? I'm going to get to that. The real deal okay. is trying to... Uh, <laughs> I see you the real deal and you're correct, but I have to explain why we thought it was a biceps injury okay. initially. So um, to explain this, we kind of have to get into the anatomy of the shoulder joint. So when you look at this, if you look all the way up to the top, all the way to the left, that little piece that's sticking out there is the acromion that comes around here on the shoulder and creates your acromioclavicular joint. So the AC joint that, you know, we thought about uh, Brandon Ayuk may have had um, with his injury. Uh, and then that little piece just next to that, that's called the coracoid process, that's going to be important because one of the attachments of the bicep tendon is to that piece. And then you see this white part here that says supraglenoid tubercle, kind of like in that area, that's the glenoid. Ooh, yep. See the like almost white colored area there. That looks like that's the glenoid cavity. So that's where your shoulder joint, your humerus kind of rests in there. Okay. And the other part of the biceps, so, so up at the shoulder, there's two heads. There's a long head attachment that connects there to sort of the upper rim of that glenoid cavity. And then the short head that connects there to that coracoid process. So now bring up the other image so we can actually see where the attachments are. So the bicep muscle has, as you can see in this picture, if you blow that up a little bit, down by the elbow, there's a one single attachment on the radius bone of the forearm. Then as it comes up to the shoulder, you have the, oops, come, just kind of, can you bring the picture down a little bit? There you go. And then bring it down so that, oop. So, <laughs> there you go, right there, right, oop, right. All right. Crocky had too much coffee today. What's happening? <laughs> Let me try downloading them because I think it's like really touchy when you try to click oh, it from the screen. Okay. And then that's why it's like zooming in super. Then let me I'm going to download them for a second. That, that'll only take a second. And then um, that should make it a little bit easier. Yeah. It's much easier for uh, show and tell to get the images going. All right. So here we go. There we go. Beautiful. That's what I want. Okay. So here at the bottom, you can see the singular attachment of the bicep on the radius bone, the radius bone in the forearm, kind of down by the elbow. Then as you go up into the shoulder, you have two heads, two tendons that come off the bicep. The short head here, like we talked about on the bone uh, of the coracoid process. Yep. Right where you're, yep. Right there. 
And then the other one, the long head, which attaches there to that glenoid fossa where the humerus sets in. Now the long head is what is most commonly torn if there's gonna be a tear at the biceps tendon at the shoulder joint. It's usually the long head. And with that, you can also have, because these tend to be injuries that come from trauma, can also happen with other injuries in the shoulder. So when you tear that, that biceps tendon there, at the long head, you also worry about injuries to the rotator cuff because the rotator cuff are the muscles that come around the shoulder to stabilize the joint. So you can get tears there. The glenoid is lined with a kind of meniscus-like material called the labrum, and you can get tears there as well. So with his injury, this is technically a shoulder issue with the biceps is injured at the long head. What they're now saying, because I think they got an MRI in, on Monday, that MRI showed there was not a tear. So he's probably just got some, they're going to call it a strain because a muscle or multiple muscles of the shoulder are strained or inflamed and irritated. That's good news. You don't want a tear of, of the biceps tendon, although the tear of the long head isn't as concerning as if he had torn at the elbow. When you tear at the elbow, that is re that requires surgery every time. Unless you're like over a certain age and you're retired and you don't really need it, then they don't, they honestly don't really repair it. They'll just kind of, you know, say, okay, well, it's, you know, it's gonna be swollen, it's gonna be inflamed and it's gonna be disfigured for life, but there's not really, we can survive without reattachment. Now, if you bring up the, the, the other pictures of the actual arm itself. All right. When you take a look at people who have ruptured their biceps tendon, they get something called the Popeye's biceps. So if you remember Popeye the Sailor Man, and his little biceps, that's literally what it looks like when someone comes into the office who's ruptured their biceps tendon. And so if you're queasy, you might not want to look at this. It's kind of like when, so that's, that's what the bicep tear looks like. So when someone comes in and that's what their bicep looks like, you kind of already can tell them, hey, you ruptured the bicep tendon. Um, I think there's another one as well. There's an, another picture. There you go. Perfect. So you can see that both in both views. So that, you know, when you see that in somebody, You'll know. And this can happen at the gym. It usually happens to people who are between the ages of 40 and 60. You know, we're, we're lifting at the gym and we didn't do maybe a proper warm up or we lifted something too heavy, too quick. Snap. And there goes your biceps tendon. So fortunately, in terms of Aaron Banks, he did not tear it. There is no partial tear. They likely thought that this tear was in the shoulder part of the biceps attachment. Um, but thankfully, he's going to be good to go. So um so I can't remember the real deal. There you go. Yep. So technically it is not a biceps tear, whether that's what they're calling the shoulder strain and it's still the biceps got strained. That part, I'm not sure that they came out and flat out said. So All right. Well, that's definitely great news for Aaron Banks, because like I said, he has, he has been playing very well. And a guy that's stringing together back-to-back -back seasons, offensive line, protecting the quarterback. You don't want him going down doing the trivia job in the run game as well. You have enough questions about the right side of the offensive line. You don't want any, there to be in issues on the left side. And if I remember correctly, I think I saw something yesterday that said he was day-to-day. -day. So Correct. at the very least, that's encouraging that he potentially can play. Now, let's say he can't. John Feliciano... He's a free agent that the 49ers got from the New York Giants, and he played very well in this game. Can, can that be consistent? I've always talked about the difference between starters and non-starters. Most of the time, it's not an ability issue, right? Like all these guys at the NFL level are talented. A lot of times, it's a consistency issue, right? So you have Aaron Banks. He's able to perform at a high level and be very consistent. Where John Feliciano, he's a reserve for a reason. He could step in. We saw him play well against the Dallas Cowboys, but can he do that week in and week out? And that's the thing that you can't really count on with reserve players. So you got to have fingers crossed if Feliciano does have to play, he does well. Because I did watch him in the preseason. He got beat. He was holding. He had multiple holding penalties called. If you could recall a terrific throw from Sam Darnold over the middle, throwing blind versus the blitz. And... It was, it was about a 25-yard throw on a rope, and it was called back because of 
Feliciano. Then he gave up a sack on that drive as well. So, um, you know, if he's out there a long time, does he start to get exposed? I don't know, you know, but I will say you want Aaron Banks to be healthy, first and foremost, but definitely be out there on the field. And I believe Feliciano was just coming back from concussion protocol. So yeah. perfect timing. <laughs> All right, speaking of concussion protocol, I don't know if Michael Parsons is concussed, but this guy, first of all, you and I came on this podcast last week, and we talked about how personal this matchup is with the Dallas Cowboys, whether it's a, a hatred for, you know, like their fan base or, you know, family members or, you know, whatever it is, just what the star is supposed to mean. You know, they're supposed to be America's team. Uh, you know, you look at all those things. And everything is like, oh, the Dallas Cowboys. And it's just like, it's personal, right? If, if you're around for the, the 90s and those battles, like, it's personal. And I guess everybody took it personal, even Fred Warner. Fred Warner took this game personal. Did you hear what he said? I just saw the clip this morning. Fred Warner grew up a Dallas Cowboy fan. And he said, they passed on me, so now I, I'm going to make them pay. Right. They like, got to so, see me. They so see me. Yeah. He said they got to see me. That's what he said. So it's personal with Fred. It's clearly personal with Debo Samuel, who's like, like, how is this not personal? But it's personal to everybody. But the guy that keeps getting their ass kicked in Michael Parsons. And it took a T-shirt, not getting your ass whooped 42 to 10, not just, you know, back to back times. This team knocked you out the playoffs, not having to prove that you can beat these guys because they're kind of your kryptonite right now. No, none of that made it personal. But what made it personal was a T-shirt that George Kittle was wearing that said, F the Dallas Cowboys. Do you think that the Cowboys aren't taking these games serious enough? And maybe that's why they are uh, maybe not, I, I, I would almost say underachieving, you know? Or do you think that's why the Cowboys are potentially underachieving? Because they're, the players and the team, they're just not taking these big matchups personal enough? I agree. Like, I don't know what the heck I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I feel like, you know, last year, I know Shanahan showed the whole team from start to finish the entire history of the Niners Cowboys rivalry, everything, right. Got them involved in what this means to their organizations, to the fan base, to everything. Right. I feel like McCarthy needs to do that for the, for the Cowboys, because I feel like they came in and just was like, yep, it's a Sunday night football game. And that's about it. Meanwhile, our team was hungry. They were locked in. They were ready to go. And it showed up on the football field. And unfortunately, I mean, listen, I will take a W. I will take the beautiful. I mean, I was able to chill out in the fourth quarter, watch your tweets come out <laughs> left and right. Oh, but, yeah. But but I do. There's nothing like a matchup that is head to head against a team like that. And then you just stick it to them at the end. So you know, if that were, if, if it were my choice, I, I would have liked the game to be a little closer just because it is such a, a match, right? Over the years, it was always a close game. It was always just that, oh, I'm going to stick your face in the mud and all of these things. And so I feel like Dallas did not rise to the occasion at all. They don't understand. They didn't, they didn't understand the assignment and therefore they failed miserably. So if it took us t-shirt, then maybe we'll get a better game next time. But Whatever. I don't I don't know. His his stock's going down in my book for sure. It's interesting because me as a competitor, and maybe that's the difference, right? Like we talk a lot about, I don't know how many, I know you have your uh, you know, a child of your own, but a lot of these kids that I coach, I feel like there's there's they don't take things personal enough. I'm like, dude, every time you step on the field, it's it's an opportunity to really just show that I I am I'm the big dog here. I have a cornerback that I coach. Uh, you know, a lot of you know I coach high school football uh, out here, Stockton, uh, Edison High School, and I have a cornerback, and he's six one, six two, athletic, long, all that, plays corner very well. But like, when he practices, sometimes, and I've told him, like, bro, I feel like at practice you're just here to practice. You're not here to actually get better every rep. I was like. There, there shouldn't be – every time if you're doing one-on-ones or whatever it is, this receiver should feel like, dang, I got to go up against Bill Berry. Like, dang, like this is going to be tough. And I'm like, they don't feel that. They line up. Everything is happy. They run their routes, and you're like, oh, if it feels a game, I would – like, no, I don't want to hear about if it were a game. I don't want to hear – like, it starts here. 
if you have a college scout that you didn't know was watching you practice right now, he wouldn't look twice at you, you know, but you yeah. are extremely talented. You got to, you got to care more on every single rep and that's how you're going to get better, you know? And I feel like that is a lot of this kind of error. So when you have a guy like Michael Parsons, who is relatively young, he might not truly understand, which it sounds crazy because he's a professional athlete and probably the most talented defensive player in the league. Right. But he doesn't understand like playing and play out game in and game out, like how yeah. important this is for some other people. And the 49ers, exactly. like they wanted to kill you and you weren't, you weren't on that same thing. That's why last week when I heard who said it, was it Rex that compared him to Lawrence Taylor? I cringed a little because Lawrence Taylor was ferocious. Like I was afraid of watching him on the TV. Like, and I'm at home and I'm behind the screen, right? This man was like, I'm like, he's strung out on something every single week. Cause there's no, I have never seen someone so angry, so hungry, so raw. Michael Parsons is a pup compared to that. Like, I'm not saying he's not talented and he may have the talent there, but you are not Lawrence Taylor. And you better not ever compare those two, especially after the, his reaction after this game, period. You don't have that kind of fight. You don't belong in that conversation. Sorry, guys. I'm I'm a little saucy again today. So. <laughs> oh no, I love it. And and see, that's the thing. Me, you know, 36 years old, I I came up kind of past Lawrence Taylor's prime, right? So I wish I could have been able to watch him and and kind of feel that. But even when you look at you know some of the players from our past, Jerry Rice, and there are a lot of people that try to say. Oh, if Jerry Rice played in this era, like he would be regular or whatever. And I'm like, why would he? Or they'll say about Michael Jordan, like, oh, Michael Jordan played in this era, like he'd be. And it's like, no, the, the thing that people don't understand, some of these guys, they're just wired different. So when you're talking about greatness, right? Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Le LeBron, Tiger Woods, like the uh, Serena and Williams, they, they, want to kill you. Mike Tyson, it, you can put them in, in any era. And because of how they were wired, they would dominate. And it sounds like Lawrence Taylor, a guy who I didn't get to watch a whole lot coming up. I've seen, you know, the NFL film stuff, but it sounds like he was a lot like that. And Michael Parsons, who has Lawrence Taylor abilities, has to understand how to get that Lawrence Taylor fight on, on every play, on every game. To hear him say that it wasn't personal and that they made it personal with a t-shirt, I was kind of taken back because that was that was wild that was wild to me i see L lkv says reggie white now reggie white's a guy i got to watch oh, no. i didn't get to watch philly reggie white i got to watch green bay reggie white and i mean again just the way he was dominant throwing guys around and stuff like that you know you just you the, some of these guys coming in now they got to understand it's not just a brand that you're creating you know you, you, you got to play for your team as well I think maybe they that that part gets a little lost here because again, what's what's he doing after the game? Like he's on Bleach, Bleach Report, and yeah. nothing against Bleach Report. I'll be on Bleach Report later today. I want to say three p.m. Pacific or maybe six p.m. Pacific. So I'll three p.m. Pacific. I'll be on Bleach Report. So nothing against Bleach Report, but uh, you know, it's like I think they're more focused on those things than being the most ferocious, relentless player. That he can be. It's like, I'm talented. I'm good. I'm faster than everybody. I'm strong. I'm quick. I can make these plays. Like, cool. Yeah. But every play has to mean something to you. And yeah. what I took from that, it just doesn't right now. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think uh, I'm on the verge of calling him overrated. On the verge. Just because, of that. just because of that. Yeah. Not going to say it yet, but like it's tippy toeing. Just really, and, and really stuck down on that. And because of how talented of a player he is, there's going to be a lot of people that they don't understand what you – like when you say, like, overrated, they're not going to be able to tie it to the – like, no, I watch him. He's talented. Like, he's one of the best. Like, look at look at the sacks. But what you're saying is like, yeah, but he's supposed to be up here. And he's – he you know, everybody else might be here and he can be here, but he's the type of player that has the ability to be here. And, uh, you know, he's, he's not, not – He's not he's complete. He's not complete because he's not there yet. So, and I don't know if that's coaching. I don't know. I don't know what that, or maybe he's just not wired that way, but I'm telling you what, like Lawrence Taylor, I would like, he could like hurt somebody. <laughs> like I think rules were changed because of athletes like Lawrence Taylor. 
Um, he was just built different. And uh, I think you gave some great analogies on, on other athletes built different as well. So and maybe built different the 49ers because you, again, George Kittle, he wore the shirt. Clearly it was personal enough to him to wear that t-shirt that said F Dallas, right? Debo Samuel was like, Hell yeah, it was personal. Like, how is it not personal? Now we'll laugh later too, you know. <laughs> yeah, I did the whole laugh now. Like, like, yeah, like, all right. Like, I don't think y'all really want to see us, but okay. Like, it's been personal to us. You know what? And we we talked about all the uh, a lot of the outlets have talked about how many touchdowns George Kittle got last week. There was one athlete that got a touchdown. I'm pretty sure he winked at the camera right at you, Croc. Kyle, you shit. <laughs> <laughs> Every now, every time I see him catch a pass or get targeted, I, I get comments on um, <laughs> I get comments on Twitter. They're like, Kyle did that for you, Croc. Kyle did that for you. It was in the fourth quarter. I wasn't sure how far down into your your, your special juice you were at at that point. So <laughs> I was still locked in because I still had to go on Bleach Report right after and locked on 49ers right after. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to figure it out. Where, there's a, where saw, there's a will, there's a way. I think I saw your brother's tweet. He said he's not doing well. He's not doing well. And he keeps trying to get us to uh, not talk about it in a group chat. But it's like, bro, you're going to continue to hear about this until y'all beat the 49ers. And y'all can't beat the 49ers. So, like, I'm not dropping it. Anytime you bring up anything about the Dallas Cowboys, I'm going to throw out there how, like, whatever you say just doesn't matter because we kicked y'all ass. Like, there's nothing you, know, you won't. You're going to have to remove yourself from the group chat if you don't want to hear about this game. And that's why I tell people, like, this is kind of my Super Bowl from <laughs> playing against the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, it's bragging rights for a really long time. How do you feel about us going up against one of the toughest defenses in the NFL and the Browns? So that's what's next. And the, 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 the tough thing is, and I said this going up against the Dallas Cowboys, who had the number two defense in the NFL. The 49ers are going to score 30-plus points. So – you know, this kind of goes back to what I asked earlier with, you know, what does it look like if the 49ers lose? The 49ers have to play a very uncharacteristic game. It's something that might just be like a single game for them to lose. And I just feel like when I've watched, and I've watched a decent amount of the Cleveland Browns. They don't have Nick Chubb. They don't even know if they have Deshaun Watson heading into this game. He's He's been out. Uh, you know, they have Amari Cooper. And he's done, excuse me, he's done well, but their defense can be as good as it is. I still haven't seen nobody stop the 49ers from scoring 30. So I assume your defense is good, cool. Niners are still score 30. What what is your offense gonna do to be able to combat with that? And I don't think they have enough right now. So uh I don't like to predict blowouts. I don't think I have yet this year, but this should be one that if the 49ers, if, if it's a one-score game in the fourth quarter, I'll be extremely surprised. What's the spread on this? I think I saw somewhere that it was 14, but this was a couple days ago, so I don't know what it is. They're coming off a bye, so they'll be at least a little bit more rested. I think they said that um, Watson is day-to-day, -day, but there's really not a lot of information about what – specifically is going on with that shoulder. It's his throwing shoulder. So <laughs> Ariel so, so here's the thing. If you are a betting person, which I might go and send a few hundred dollars to somebody that can bet on I'll I'll be I'll actually be in Reno uh this weekend. So I'll probably I'll be placing bets and I hope this line doesn't move. But right now it's 49ers minus six and a half. So if the 49ers win by a touchdown, like you win. Yeah you know, like that like you now I don't know what the uh they also have like a uh, – yeah, and the over-under on – is it supposed to be bad weather or something because it's 37 points? Somebody said it's windy and rainy. Uh, okay. See, now games like that, I'm not going to lie. Listen, I was in Chicago last year. Uh, we watched the – there was also a, a game where the 49ers played the Colts and it was pouring down raining and, and the Colts were able to beat the 49ers, right? Like the, that rainy weather – and like bad conditions, that can kind of make weird things happen. The weird things that I feel like it would take for the 49ers to lose can happen when you're playing in that kind of weather. It's a little bit more unpredictable. So I still take the 49ers minus six and a half, but 
the fact that it's only minus six and a half right now, it, it's a little bit more understandable, I guess. Everybody else saying five and a half. See, I don't even see five and a half. I definitely, I'll jump all, all over that. I might even, there's some that you can, you can add, I don't know how much you bet, Coach Desi, but you can add point, not at all. So let's say it's, it's minus five and a half for the 49ers. Basically, they're saying they'll win by five and a half. And the home team gets three points. So if they were in the Bay, they would be favored by um, eight and a half if the line is five and a half. All right. Uh, but some you can add points to it on some apps. So you could say, you know what? I'm going to take the 49ers minus 11 and a half because I just think they're going to – or minus 14. And obviously your odds go more in your favor of winning more money so um, it would be a much bigger payout. I would probably go that route because uh, unless the, the conditions are bad. Yeah, it says game time weather, 55 degrees and rainy. I see that. Uh, they'd have to be really bad for the 49ers to not just destroy them. Yeah, I don't bet because I'm too superstitious. So then I would think that my bet would alter. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I know. I always feel like that too. You know, I do a lot of underdog fantasy promo code Crocky. And every time it's like, well, uh, there, when something happens that typically you either wouldn't pay attention to, or it happened and is against what you wanted, it's like, well, of course, of course, this happened. Well, you know, when I put money on this team, and I feel like that's what would happen if I put money. I, I usually don't bet on the 49ers either. So. Okay, I can't do it. You saw Jason <sighs> Brett, right? He's he's uh recovered from his Achilles tear last year, is now. Moving on to Texas. Shout out to Jason Verrett. Shout out to Jason Verrett. You know, um, you know, I've talked a lot on here about you know adversity and things like that, and and why, you know, I root for players no matter what, right? Forty uh, nine er fan, you know, die hard, of course, but I do root for players around the league. You know, I, I, I root for Trey Lance. Like I want to see, and not like Trey Lance, the Cowboy player, just Trey Lance, the person. That's a football player. You know, I want to see him do well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of players. Akilah Witherspoon, you know, he's a guy that I rooted for a lot when he was on the Niners. So, you know, when I watch him and he had an interception on Sunday, big interception in the red zone, it's like, that's cool. You know, good good for you, Akello. You know, mm -hmm. now again, they play the 49ers, F them. But, <laughs> when, you know, when they're just playing, I, I do root for the player and really more so the person. And uh, Jason Verrett, he's one of those guys where you've seen all this adversity that he's had to go through. You know, you work back from an injury, then boom, he gets injured again. Then he's worked back from an injury, then boom, he gets injured again. And he definitely has more, more lives than the cat. But it's been amazing to see just this relentlessness and willingness to just keep trying. And I know he got signed to the practice squad, whatever. I mean, this is a guy that clearly, like, he, he must be trying to prove something to himself Cause it's like, dude, we know you're tough. We know you, you're gritty. You ain't got nothing to prove to us. But maybe you know, to himself, it's like, now, nah, like, I have to prove to myself that I can get on that field one more time. And it's been amazing, truly, to to see the adversity he's been able to go through. I again, I root for, I root for those stories for sure. Yeah. For those who don't know, he's ruptured both Achilles and he's ruptured both ACLs. And I think it's his left shoulder labral tear. So the labrum, like we talked about earlier today, that meniscus like padding that coats the glenoid fossa where the humerus sits in, that was torn. So he has definitely been through massive surgeries Four? can you imagine four massive surgeries in your NFL career? That's tough. Yeah, that's, that's tough. So congrats to him for coming back again, nine lives. Nine lives, more lives than a cat. But Coach Desi, I appreciate you for coming on. Um, of course, it was awesome. Appreciate you for sharing your knowledge on Aaron Banks and the bicep injury. That's not a bicep injury. <laughs> <laughs> I love the intro, and I will be taking that out, and I'm gonna try to use that. I'm gonna I'm gonna get on that today, see if we can start using that for Sweet. an intro. Sweet. Uh, One more thing. This is PA Week, and for those of you who don't know actually what I am, I'm not a physical therapist. I'm not a physician. I'm not a nurse. I am a physician assistant, also known as a physician associate. And if you don't know what a PA is, we are considered an advanced practice practitioners or a mid-level provider. We're like nurse practitioners, if you know what those are. We have a different set of training. 
but we are able to diagnose, treat, um, perform procedures like spinal taps and sutures and putting bones back into place and things like that. So we're a very valuable part of the team. Um, and so if you know a PA, give them a high five this week because it's PA week. And so I just wanted to share with you guys what it is that I do in the profession that I've been a part of for 20 years. Um, so I have limitations to what I can do. I can't do a surgery all by myself, but I do and have assisted in many surgeries. So uh, like I said, if you know a PA, give them a high five. Um, they definitely deserve it. And uh, we're happy to be taking care of our communities. Oh, that's what's up, Coach Desi. And uh, I'm giving you a virtual high five there. <laughs> not, not That was kind of corny, but I'm going <laughs> to give you a virtual uh, high five. And definitely, I mean, you know, the work that you do is is much appreciated on this show. So thank you for coming on every Wednesday. Thank you. You guys, uh, let's keep this thing going. Faithful to the Bay. Let's get it. Let's get it. Appreciate everybody that's in the chat right now. Again, this show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy promo code Crocky. So uh, I had a rough week end. All right. Thursday, Thursday, I was good. Thursday, good. Hit for 400 on Underdog Fantasy. But Saturday and Sunday kicked my ass. And Monday. I mean, just... Just donut, 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 just no wins. So if you want to get in on it and have better luck than I had this weekend, uh, download the app right now or go to underdogfantasy.com and use promo code Crocky. All right. But that's going to do it for this episode. You got to catch me here most likely Friday with a preview of the Cleveland Browns uh, 49ers game. I'm excited to see that and talk to you all more about it. And, you know, if you're not – Tuning into the YouTube channel. Of course, you got under the uh not under our fantasy. You got uh, locked over 49 ers with myself, Brian Peacock. Uh, we come at you five days a week. We got the crossover episode that we're recording today. So I'm excited about that. And what else I got going on? Bleach Report. I'll be on right now or today at 3 p.m. Pacific. I'll be on before the game. I told them I don't want to do the post-game show. So uh, you can catch me on Bleach Report as well. But until next time. I'm out. Peace.